Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Policy Exchange. Uh, my name is David Skelton. I'm the acting director here at Policy Exchange and delighted to welcome David Willett here this morning, the Minister of State for Universities and Science. Um, this event is the first in our series of events about what a new industrial policy might look like, asking the questions about what is it that the government can do to help create the conditions for industrial growth, for manufacturing growth, and also what government can do to make the most of those areas where the UK already has a comparative advantage or has a potential comparative advantage. Um, we're delighted that David has written this paper for us on eight great technologies um, in which the U UK can hopefully apply our world-class research in, into growth and which will help our growth, prosperity and competitiveness, um, which David is going to talk about this morning. You should all have a copy of this paper on your seat. If not, there's copies at the back. And for members of the media, there's also copies of David's speech at the back <coughs> as well. Um, so without any more ado, can you please welcome me, join me in welcoming David Willett. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dave. It's great to be here. It's great to be once more at Policy Exchange. And it, actually, I kind of launched some of this a year ago when I spoke at Policy Exchange about the importance of a high-tech industrial strategy. Uh, and let me say how much I appreciate both the extraordinary efficiency and flexibility that Policy of Exchange have showed in working with me on this pamphlet and this speech, and I think also starting this programme of yours on industrial policy, which is really important and is one of the coalition's most important single commitments to delivering long-term growth for the economy. So it's, this is the right place to come back after the uh, speech I delivered here almost exactly a year ago. And what I argued, oops, slightly low-tech problem here, the microphone falling over. Um, uh, the, uh, what I argued in that speech a year ago was that there's a lot that government can and must do to drive the development of general purpose technologies. And today I can update you on the progress we're making and announce where we're providing more funding for those key technologies. Vince Cable set out in an important speech in September last year our approach to industrial strategy. It's a long-term approach across the whole of government to give business the confidence uh, to invest and to grow. Technologies and the broader research which underpins their development is a fundamental part of our approach to industrial strategy. And today I can set out our new decisions to drive this forward. Let me start by saying we are very fortunate to have a broad science and research base. Indeed, there is no other medium-sized economy which has anything like our range of world-class research activity. And this is clearly demonstrated in the Research Council impact reports which we are publishing today. It's not just the Nobel Prizes, the winners of the Fields Medal, the world-famous professors. Wherever there is a crisis, a civil war, a coup d'etat, Anywhere in the world, we're likely to have a historian who has some understanding of the background, anthropologists who know the culture, and someone who can speak the language. This is an extraordinary privilege which we must not take for granted. Citizens of very few other countries have such a wide open window on the world. And the very range of what we do is one of our greatest assets, especially as great technological and scientific advances depend on breaking down the conventional barriers between disciplines. So we have the extraordinary advantage of being the only medium-sized country that has such a range of activities. And it's not just physical science, it's arts and humanities as well. It's not just STEM, it is STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. Read Elsevier's 2011 review of the comparative performance of the UK research base identified 400 niche areas of research in which the UK was distinctively strong. So the first pillar for our science and innovation policy is to maintain that breadth and not to direct our scientific and research community into particular research projects. There's a second pillar too. After the failure of the economic interventionism of the 1970s, and the triumph of the liberal revolution in economic policy of the 1980s, 
We're wary of government trying to pick winners. So insofar as governments can raise the growth rate, we tend to focus on measures which apply across the economy as a whole. Deregulation, lower corporate taxes, ease of setting up business. And indeed, <coughs> excuse me, indeed, the UK is already ranked second in the G7 for ease of doing business. These are what are called the horizontal measures across an economy. Put the breadth of our science base together with the dominant intellectual climate of free market liberalism, and you get classic British policy on science and technology. We finance a broad range of research selected by fellow scientists on the basis of its excellence, and the government works hard at tearing down the barriers to the smooth functioning of a modern market economy. Strong science and flexible markets is a good combination of policies. But, like patriotism, it is not enough. It misses out crucial stuff in the middle. Real decisions on backing key technologies on their journey from the lab to the marketplace. It's the missing third pillar of any successful high-tech strategy. It's R&D and technology and engineering as distinct from pure science. It's our historic failure to back this which lies behind the familiar problems of the so-called valley of death between scientific discoveries and commercial applications. And also, as, we, as I hope to explain, it shows why we believe that we lack a culture of risk-taking. We're living now with the long-term consequences of failing to have a policy to back these key technologies. Look at the business sectors where we're strong. Creative industries, financial services, construction, new web-based services, they are all share a crucial feature. They're all areas without capital-intensive R&D. So paradoxically, the very aversion to backing particular technologies with R&D has itself contributed to a change in the structure of the British economy. An economy which innovates, we can be proud of our innovation, but does not do as much R&D as many of our competitors. Focusing on R&D and on particular technologies is not the same as picking winners, which notoriously became losers picking the pockets of taxpayers. It's not backing particular businesses. Instead, we're focusing on big, general-purpose technologies. Each one has implications potentially so significant that they stretch way beyond any one particular industrial sector. Information technology has transformed retailing, for example. Satellite services could deliver precision agriculture. This is where we face the valley of death. It's after the pure science and before the usual process of individual companies developing particular products and processes. It's R&D. It is also, incidentally, where British government did used to play a crucial role, supporting the military-industrial complex of the 20th century warfare state described by David Edgerton. It's also what the US still does far more than we do. It's hard to see because you have to look behind the rhetoric in America of limited government, but actually the US does a lot of this. Our research councils in Britain tend to focus on more upstream research, whereas in the US, DARPA, the National Institutes for Health, the Department of Energy, go further downstream, closer to market. Sometimes our approach can look like mother birds pushing their fledglings out of the nest, but with too many falling to the forest floor to be eaten by foxes. And we think our problem is that we lack the same willingness to take risk as they have in the US. But the truth is, we are expecting companies to step in earlier, taking more risk than in the US or elsewhere. The Technology Strategy Board is a crucial but underestimated institution which can help plug that gap. It's working more closely than ever before with our research councils to get more sustained support from Blue Skies Research to closer to commercialization. And as part of our life sciences strategy, for example, we set up a biomedical catalyst worth 180 million pounds, split 50-50 between the Medical Research Council and the Technology Strategy Board to take new medical innovations closer to practical application. Already this scheme is a real success, and I'm keen to repeat this model elsewhere. Yesterday, indeed, I announced a new £25 million catalyst fund for industrial biotechnology and bioenergy, 
linking the BBSRC and the Technology Strategy Board. Of course, just, doing the, just showing that they do it in the US doesn't prove the point on its own. So let me, before I turn to the specific technologies, identify four objections to what uh, we are doing. First, we have to accept we make mistakes. We do not have perfect foresight. Some of the technologies for which we have high hopes today will turn out to be clunkers tomorrow. That's because this is all about taking risk. If the risk was much lower, then we could indeed leave it to straightforward business decisions. But we do have a range of expertise to help us understand scientific and technological trends, and we have set out our thinking more openly than ever before. Indeed, that is why I'm releasing today my pamphlet describing eight great technologies. This is, a, for me as a layman, distilling a lot of the expert advice I get in biz, and which is published with advice from the research councils, the Technology Strategy Board, the Government Office of the Chief Scientist and others. So, of course we don't have perfect foresight. I'm not claiming we do. Secondly, second objection, we're told the high-tech sector is so small that the real commercial, big commercial issues are elsewhere. Now, the OECD defines sectors as high-tech if they devote more than 4% of turnover to R&D. This is a demanding test, and companies which do this are indeed very unusual. But they can develop technologies which then go mainstream and have a massive impact way beyond any specific sector. So these new technologies may be absorbed by business sectors that themselves do little R&D but are nevertheless transformed. That's why the impact of these high technologies is far bigger than the OECD measure of company activity would imply. Thirdly, third problem, the danger that incumbents get the support, not insurgents. And new small businesses are crucial. We have a range of programs specifically aimed at promoting them. But the fact is that a lot of the R&D spend is in big business. Indeed, our shortage of big primes at the top of supply chains is one of our key industrial weaknesses. So big business does matter. Where we do have key primes, as is automotive, the aerospace or life sciences sectors, they themselves can be protectors of small business as they maintain a supply chain. And moreover, those big businesses may not have a cushy time. These new technologies are almost all inherently destabilizing. They are a challenge to traditional businesses, which find themselves having to adjust to the arrival of new technologies which disrupt what they do. The ones that survive have to move way beyond their traditional technologies and sectors. And indeed, there is an interesting trend of patents being taken out for technologies which go by individual firms in areas which go way beyond what we think of as their traditional activities. The uh, automotive industry taking out more patents in IT, for example, as it becomes crucial to the performance of a car. The fourth and final objection is the fear that politicians are always seduced by baubles. We go for glitzy new projects rather than what has real potential. That's why it is so important that we draw on expert advice, which has to be more transparent than ever before. The pamphlet which I'm publishing today and identifying these eight great technologies is not my personal view. It distills work done by the experts I mentioned earlier, and we have published their reports. In an important speech to the Royal Society last November, George Osborne listed the eight technologies and asked if people agreed with them. And by and large, our analysis, which we set out in that speech, has been accepted. And as well as identifying those technologies today, I want to set out more fully than ever before what we're doing to back them. Let me start by the basic of Industrial Strategy 101. You set up a leadership council, probably co-chaired by a biz minister and a senior industry figure, researchers, businesses, perhaps regulators and major public purchasers come together. You use it to get people talking to each other confidently and frankly. Then that group might commission a trusted expert to prepare a technology roadmap, which assesses where the key technologies are heading over the next five years or so. Just, uh, just this exercise, before any increase in public funding, can transform behaviour. Some of the big companies might, for example, have a headquarters abroad. It means that their managers here, and also biz ministers, can show to them what we are doing to encourage 
more investment. What we're doing, and that in turn encourages more investment here, it can encourage businesses sitting on piles of cash. We have a £750 billion cash mountain belonging to businesses in Britain. It can encourage them to spend some of that on investment alongside the government's commitment to spending money on research. You might even go further and find if the government puts some more money up front, it can prompt more co-investment by others. You might find key regulations which need to be eased, or perhaps the opposite, new regulations which are needed to help give confidence that a new technology can safely be adopted. Government might, in these environments, be more open about its procurement plans. And, but crucially, you have a vehicle for building mutual trust. I believe, and this is one of the crucial propositions uh, that at the heart of what we do at Biz, that the quality of links between business, the research community, and government is itself a source of competitive advantage in the modern world. And let me now very briefly review progress on each of these eight key technologies. They will be backed further by the decisions I am announcing today in this speech on the allocation of an extra £600 million of funding. This investment in science and technology announced by George Osborne in the autumn statement is additional to the ring fence science budget. First, big data. The power of computing and data handling is now becoming so great that classic distinctions between micro and macro effects are breaking down. Uh, the importance of these developments is being recognized around the world. I note I'm actually giving this speech on the same date as Data Innovation Day in the US. That's why we chose it, isn't it, Dave? We have set up the E-Infrastructure Leadership Council, co-chaired by Dominic Tilsley, formerly at Unilever, and myself. We share with industry our plans for research funding so as to encourage co-investment by them. And we're seeing the benefits already with companies such as IBM, Cisco, Intel, making a number of investments into the UK. They invest more as they see us invest more in computational infrastructure to capture and analyse data flows released by the open data revolution. Back in October 2011, we announced an extra £150 million investment in EE infrastructure. This has been followed by a further allocation that I can confirm today of an extra £189 million out of the £600 million in the autumn statement. This will be invested over the next two years in key areas such as bioinformatics and environmental monitoring. And I should say our investment in data is also ensured we maintain our leadership in social science with programmes such as the 2012 Birth Cohort Study. So there's a further investment in e-infrastructure. Second technology, space. The UK is once more seen as a leading space science nation. Companies have focused on making satellite technology more affordable with smaller, lighter weight satellites that lower the cost of commercial launches. You may think that you launch a uh, satellite by it being trundled in a massive uh, rocket across a launch station in uh, Cape Canaveral. Tomorrow I'll be visiting Clyde Space. They get their satellites launched by pay paying a courier to deliver their satellites, which are 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 30 centimetres by travelling to Baikonur to stick in the corner of a uh, rocket launch from the US. So you can do small satellites as well. Roughly 40% of the world's small satellites come from Guildford. And now even smaller nanosatellites are coming from SSTL and from Clyde Space in Glasgow. In March 2011, we announced a £10 million national space technology programme in the UK. And this original programme attached £17 million in matched funding from industry and institutional investors. Early analysis suggests the return to the economy from this investment of £10 million will be between 50 million and 75 million pounds. And today I can announce that as a result of the autumn statement, the government will be in investing an extra 25 million pounds in the further implementation of the technology vision through phase two of the National Space Technology Programme. This 25 million of further investment will meet unmet demand as many excellent projects were not supported in the first stage. Third, robotics and autonomous systems. The UK has some distinctive strengths in this area, going back yet again to our abilities in software programming and data handling. 
Effective handling of data from a range of sources is a key to autonomous systems, and we have real skills here. It was an extraordinary feat of engineering for the landing of NASA's Curiosity probe on Mars last year. But its Mars rover vehicle, however, is largely controlled from Earth, with a delay of at least seven minutes as instructions travel to Mars, which means that the range of operations during the time of Martian light, when it has its power source active, is modest. The European Mars <laughs> rover vehicle, due to land in 2018, is far more autonomous, using mainly British technology to enable it to travel further during the Martian day and therefore carry out more investigations during its design life. The Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council funds much of the research on robotics. It has so many different applications across different industrial sectors that the R&D effort is fragmented. There's also no single leading major industrial prime in this technology area. In October of last year, I convened a meeting of key experts on robotics and autonomous systems at the Royal Academy of Engineering to discuss what more could be done to promote this important general purpose technology. And the discussion did show the need for greater coordination. So the Technology Strategy Board is now creating a special interest group on robotics and autonomous systems, which will shortly produce an outline technology roadmap to promote further investment. The participants in last October's meeting also proposed academic centres of excellence that would both conduct basic research but also translate it for commercial application. And for this reason, I am announcing today an investment of an extra £35 million for centres of excellence in robotics and autonomous systems. They will be hubs of technical expertise and training, providing cutting-edge facilities and opportunities for business networking. Then fourth, synthetic biology. Many of the critical discoveries related to DNA were made in Britain, in perhaps the world's greatest post-war research institute, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Now, you'll have noticed the first three technologies that I described were all in their broadest sense IT-related. The computers, satellites, a very important source of new data, and thirdly, robotics and autonomous systems, which essentially are only possible because of massive advances in software. After those three technologies, my next three technologies, which you might have called the info technologies, I'm now moving on to what they call the wetter technologies of the biological sciences. But one of the part of the significance of the discovery of DNA by Watson and Crick was very helpfully given the, the stage of our technology, it comes in digital form. It is digital information. Nature is providing us with information ready digitized. So the future, as they say, is the convergence of the dry technologies of information and computing in my first three examples to the wetter, with, on the wetter biological sciences as well. More re uh, recently, so researchers funded by EPSRC have successfully demonstrated that they can build some of the basic components for digital devices out of bacteria and DNA, which could pave the way for a new generation of biological computing devices. Indeed, just this morning, as the endless excitement of technological advance, I'm told Cambridge has made a further announcement about precisely that. We produced a synthetic biology roadmap last year, and a new synthetic biology council has been established to ensure this roadmap is, is delivered. I co-chair it with Lionel Clark, a senior executive from Shell. We're making a series of investments in research in synthetic biology. The UK Research Councils and the Technology Strategy Board are spending over £90 million on world-leading synthetic biology research and commercialisation, including £20 million announced by the Chancellor last November. We announced as part of our Life Science Strategy One Year on Update in December that a further £50 million will be invested in synthetic biology as part of the Autumn Statement Settlement. This will be used to support implementation of key recommendations from the roadmap, including establishing multidisciplinary research centres, as well as a seed fund to support start-up companies and pre-companies. We also announce we're investing £38 million in a national biologics industry innovation centre. This investment will allow the development of a large-scale facility for the 
uh, uh, for the manufacture of biologically produced medicines such as antibodies and vaccines. At present, no major pharmaceutical companies manufacture significant quantities of biologics in the UK. So this centre will fill a gap in biologic manufacturing capability and strengthen the UK's case as the location of choice for internationally mobile life science companies. Fifth on my list, regenerative medicine, which involves restoring functions by replacing or restoring human cells, tissues or organs. There are three main approaches that researchers are pursuing. Transplantation of cells, tissues and organs. Stimulation of the body's own self-repair mechanisms. And the development of new biomaterials for structural repairs. This is led by world-class research in centres such as Glasgow, where Dolly the Sheep was cloned, Cambridge, Leeds and London. Our research has moved on from Dolly the Sheep to Jasper the Dog. And you may remember Jasper. He had spinal injuries but was able to walk again by injecting his spinal cords with a specific type of stem cell. The potential applications for human medicine are easy to envisage. The Research Councils and the Technology Strategy Board recently published a strategy for UK regenerative medicine, including commitments of £25 million for the UK regenerative medicine platform and £75 million for translational research. And as, <coughs> excuse me, our cell therapy catapult has now opened at Guy's Hospital in London. An extra £20 million of capital was allocated to the regenerative medicine platform in the autumn statement to provide imaging and cell manufactured technologies and a clean room. Sixth, the agri-science, uh, agri because as well as leading the Industrial Revolution, remember we also led the Agricultural Revolution in the eight, late 18th century. Chickens are a prime example of modern agri-science. Chickens are the world's biggest source of meat. They're particularly important in Asia. We breed the world's chickens. Of the 85 billion pound global poultry market, 80% of breeding chickens come from genetic stock developed in the UK. Thanks to our genetics research, you get twice as much chicken for a given amount of chicken feed as 20 years ago. Each year, we launch a new breed of chicken, which will produce many new generations of, a year, of over a year or more before a new improved version comes along. This is possible because of close links between the Rosnan Institute in Edinburgh and it, with its world-leading R&D in our commercial sector. And we in biz are working with DEFRA and with industry to strengthen links between research spend and agricultural policy. Work that will be brought together in a new agri-tech strategy we'll be launching in the next few months. But we're already investing £250 million in the transformation of the Purbright Institute of Animal Health, as well as at Babraham and Norwich Science Parks. The autumn statement earmarked £30 million for capital investment in the BBSRC's world-leading agri-science campuses. And a candidate for this is the construction of a new plant phenomics centre at Aberystwyth University. Seventh on my list, advanced materials, a key tool for advanced manufacturing. This, uh, there's been quite a flurry of activity recently in an interest in 3D printing or additive layer manufacturing. This new technology is possible partly because of advances in IT and partly because of advances in the materials that go into the process. It's no longer just a matter of printing out designer dolls. Southampton University has used advanced materials to show how we could print out a new aeroplane. The Prime Minister convened a seminar last summer on advanced materials which showed the importance of advanced materials for advanced manufacturing. As a result, I can announce today an extra £45 million in advanced materials research for new facilities and equipment in areas of UK strength, such as advanced composites, high-performance alloys, uh, alloys, low energy electronics and telecommunications, materials for energy and nanomaterials for health. In addition, we announced in, as part of that autumn statement a £20 million expansion of the National Composite Centre located on the Bristol and, si uh, Bristol and Bath Science Park. It's one of the seven centres within the high-value manufacturing catapult. Uh, this will uh, give the space to install equipment to work on larger structures made of composite materials. Eighth, and finally on my list, energy. 
Efficient energy technology, storage technologies, could allow the UK to capitalise on what is sometimes uh, excess energy production. Greater energy storage can save money and reduce the national carbon footprint at the same time. Uh, energy is one of the largest single themes in Research Council funded research with a portfolio of over £600 million of current awards. But in addition, I can announce today the government will invest an extra £30 million to create dedicated R&D facilities to develop and test new grid-stale storage technologies. We're also considering a strategic opportunity to partner with the US Department of Energy in the development of small modular re nuclear reactor technology. So I've listed eight technologies that have been identified by the experts and that we're backing. Behind these technologies lie a network of research labs and facilities, which are themselves a crucial national asset. And we are stimulating research clusters like Harwell and Darsbury, which are both now enterprise zones. And I'm delighted to announce that an extra £65 million from the autumn statement will be invested in buildings, joint facilities, infrastructure to, pro to promote co-location of industrial and academic groups and support further development of our leading research campuses. Investment will mainly be focused around the development of four campuses, Rothamsted Research Campus, Aberystwyth, Harwell near Oxford and SciTech Darsbury. This will enable the UK to accelerate the exploitation of its world leading research base to deliver jobs and growth by bringing together substantial research capabilities. Scientists also need constantly to upgrade their equipment and labs. Indeed, the interaction between science and technology is itself one of the great drivers of innovation. For this reason, we will be investing an extra £50 million in these over the next two years. We're also encouraging academics to think about the wider impact of what they do. It does not mean foreca faking forecasts of likely benefits in inherently uncertain activities. And I welcome the recent step by EPSRC to tackle these anxieties. For all these eight great te technologies to come to market, we also need excellent measurement. And as part of the autumn statement, I can also today announce that we are providing an extra £25 million to build a state-of-the-art laboratory for cutting-edge measurement research. The creation of advanced facilities at the National Physical Laboratory in, Ked in Teddington will allow scientists there to undertake leading-edge research in key nano and quantum metrology programs. Um, also, to underpin the development of the technologies within these eight areas, we need highly skilled individuals. To support this, the EPSRC is making an investment, and this, unlike my other announcements, this is from within the science ring fence budget, of a £350 million investment in centres for doctoral training to develop the talented people that will create future growth and a more sustainable future. Centres will be in areas including the digital economy, renewable and nuclear energy, synthetic biology, materials technologies, regenerative medicine, data to knowledge and advanced manufacturing. I can now therefore set out the allocation of the extra £600 million of extra science funding committed in the autumn statement. This adds up to, uh, this comprises the following as a summary of what I've announced. £189 million for big data, £25 million for space, £35 million for robotics and autonomous systems, £88 million for synthetic biology, £20 million for regenerative medicine, £30 million for agri-science campuses, £73 million for advanced materials, and £30 million for energy. We've also committed a further £35 million for research campuses, £25 million for advanced metrology, £50 million for transformative equipment and infrastructure. I hope that adds up to £600 million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, if it's less, come to me with ideas for how we spend the balance. <clears throat> now, the the, let me conclude, therefore. So this pamphlet on our uh, eight great technologies is being published today. I would like to invite you back in 10 years' time on the 24th of January, 2023. Now, there are risks. I may not be around. <laughs> Policy exchange may not be, although I'm pretty optimistic about that. But I hope most of us here are. 
and that we'll still be excited about science and technology. But imagine we're burying this in a time capsule and we're going to open it up in 10 years' time when we can take stock. Now, one possibility is that, of course, technology will have developed in a way completely different than that set out here. I am still waiting to commute to work using a personal jet booster pack that Sean Connery used in Thunderball. <laughs> there could well be new technologies as well we've just not considered. So we're not claiming perfect foresight. But in addition, there are six real possibilities for the long-term impact of our strategy for these eight great technologies. And here they are. First, false dawn. We're still waiting. The analysis broadly stands, but it all takes longer than we had hoped. Robots, for example, are still trundling around labs, not yet waiting on us at table. Two, transmutation. The technologies will not have worked out in the way we expected, but new businesses will have emerged in a more indirect route. As every film rom-com shows, things rarely work out in a straightforward way. The BBC Acorn computer, was crucial to the development of what is now a world-leading business, ARM. All out of a project went out of Bristol for the BBC. Third option, gone abroad. The technologies play out roughly as we describe, but it all happens abroad. We have a few multimillionaires who sold their ideas to foreign multinationals, but not much else. It's one of my fears. Some people say that we grow the world's best corporate veal. Fourth, it's here, but it isn't ours. We've grown the companies here, so they've put down roots, and we've got genuine expertise, which cannot be shifted. But ultimately, they're owned by a big corporate, which may have its HQ somewhere else. Illumina is a happy example of precisely such a phenomenon. Fifth, we have grown big new companies. Just as the US has got Google, Amazon, Facebook, eBay, Let's hope we would have more companies like Vodafone or GSK or Rolls-Royce. That would mean we get the regulations right. We have patient capital. We are home to more top 500 companies than we are now. And sixth, we are purveyors of R&D to the world. We host the world's research clusters, from Formula One in the Oxford, <coughs> Warwick, Birmingham area, to Tech City in East London and space activity around Harwell, we're famous already for our world-class R&D centers. The emerging economies become keen to work with us because creating a world-class university from scratch is hard. It's smarter to work with the ones you already have. So Britain is increasingly recognized as the world's best R&D lab. We've achieved our ambition of being the best place in the world to do science. Multinationals base their R&D facilities here. Smart people from around the world want to come and research here. We've also earned a reputation as the best managers of big international scientific projects. I believe that with our eight technologies, we'll probably have a mix of these outcomes. But I'm optimistic. With our strong support for R&D and these new measures for converting discovery into commercial opportunities, we can indeed achieve a lot. We can help new businesses grow. We can be the world's R&D lamb. We can indeed be the best place in the world to do science. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, David. That was really fascinating. I can see our very well-organized events team already planning that event for 10 years' time as well. Um, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, let's go first the gentleman in the second row, um, and then the gentleman here. Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute at London School of Economics. Um, clearly, the, uh, I think the scientific community would welcome the additional money that was uh, announced in the autumn statement, which you've described in more detail today. And you're clearly a, a thoughtful and enthusiastic advocate within government for the value of scientific research. But the fact remains that the additional money is probably only a standstill in terms of UK investment in uh, uh, R&D. And the latest OECD stats show that we're below average in the EU and we've been overtaken for the first time by China. So the question is really what kind of outputs do you think we need to see from the science base to convince both the Chancellor and 
private sector CEOs to invest more in UK R&D and the science base? Well, we've had, I think the, the, protect, the cash protected 4.6 billion pounds a year science budget for all current spending, I think was a, uh, you know, a very good outcome when public spending is so tight. Since then, if you include this, this latest 600 million that I've been um, allocating today, we have added, added a further one and a half billion pounds of science spend, mainly on capital. If you add that in to the, to the previous capital budget, we're roughly at the level of capital spend that we've had over the previous decade. But when I go around other countries, um, I mean, there, we are, have got, we're very productive with that, um, and we have got distinctive advantage. America has a surge of spending, but then it had a fall again. The stability itself is worth quite a lot. Um, I think the challenge, though, to go further is to trigger co-investment by companies. When you look at the R&D compared with other countries, our problem is at least as much on the private spend part of the equation as the public spend. And I was very frank at the beginning of my talk, we have ended up with a structure of our economy that tends to be concentrated in non-R&D intensive sectors. Now, there's a chicken and egg debate, and there are learned experts in this room who know better than me where the patterns of causation might go. But I do want to use this to promote co-investment by business. I didn't have time to refer to it, but for example, our look at our higher education capital fund where we allocated 100 million in the budget last year, which became 300 million in the autumn, for public spending on new R&D facilities on university campuses. But we set a condition. We set there had to be a two to one ratio of commercial investment alongside. And um, we've achieved it. it gets, we're going to get a billion pounds of capital spend on new R&D facilities in universities, completely separate to an additional what I've been talking about today, uh, which only 300 million is public money. So using it more smartly to trigger private investment as well. Gentleman in the front row. I have um, two questions, actually. The first one's very quick, though. Um, in uh, December, George Osborne announced 60 million of funding for uh, space. Is this an additional 25 million, or has that 60 taken a cut? Um, and, and the second question is um, related to the, 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 these eight areas as a whole. It seems like a lot of these have been chosen for sort of their potential for economic growth. Um, a couple of months ago, the Nuffield Council published a report <coughs> on bioethics where they actually questioned a lot of government policy on investment, saying that history doesn't really bear out our expectations of growth and said that policy is surprisingly resistant to evidence in that respect. I just wonder uh, sort of how, how confident you are about the, you know, the, the idea that, that we're going to make some, some money out of these, these pro projects. On your first specific point, yes, the £25 million pound is separate from an additional to the £60 million, pounds, which was for our contribution to the uh, increase in our contribution to the European Space Agency. On your wider point, I mean, I, I, um, all I can say is we have drawn, as I try to explain the model, pure science is curiosity driven and has, uh, and essentially the spending is determined by peer review amongst the scientific community. And that's where a lot, not, not all, but that's the basic reallocation of a lot of the 4.6 million within the ring fence. When you're looking at the next stage of how you bridge that valley of death, there is a uh, strategic role for government acting on the advice of experts. And the criteria we use, and again, this is not ministerial whim, are, is this an area where Britain has a strong scientific and technological presence? Is it an area where there is likely to be a big business sector in the future? And this is an area where we can promote or see already Locate businesses located in the UK that could do something with it. Now, life is complicated and unpredictable, but uh, alongside, and we, but I think we have gone too far in taking the, the manifest failures of the 1970s, leading to a crippling fear that nobody should take any decisions in this area. You have to decide. We're not going to get it all right, but you have to decide. In the US, government agencies have the confidence to decide. They back these technologies, and they know they're not all going to turn out. 
They know that some of them will, and they may take a more indirect route. I'm only saying we need to do in Britain what they do in the US, what they do on the continent, and I'm very happy to be held to account in 10 years' time, and we'll, we will see. And I think there will be stories like the BBC ACORN to arm story. I'm not claiming this is going to be some kind of linear process. It's not linear, but I do think we will, we will sustain an ecosystem out of which successful businesses will emerge. The gentleman with the blue tie in the second row. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm uh, Matthew Trimming. Two quick uh, things, David. One is uh, I think the Infrastructure Council, by general consensus, had a good first year. Be interested to hear what you want to it to achieve in, in its sort of second year under your co-chairmanship. And also, just to invite you to say a little bit more <coughs> on the co-investment area, because I think um, we've moved a long, long way from a sort of dialogue of the deaf between large swathes of the uh, economy and the research and academic communities. Um, but I still think there's probably a way to go, particularly helping people understand with a little bit more granularity about how those aggregate numbers that are very impressive and, and excellent that you've announced today actually feed through into real things that people yeah. can go to their boards and say, well, look, yeah. for every quid they're putting in, we'll put in you know, two euros or two dollars or, or whatever. Yeah. I think that would be helpful. Right. If on high performance computing, and again, this also goes back to your question, uh, I was over in, in California a couple of weeks ago look, visiting the Livermore Labs, federal funded scientific facility in the US. And their agenda for high performance computing is very much like ours. And they, we think we're the, we're the two countries that are probably ahead of the pack on this. And so for high performance computing, what we have is large companies that are using high performance computing for um, modeling and prototyping. So the days when you I think a lot of people in this room will remember those old Volvo adverts where they used to drive a Volvo to brick wall with a dummy and a few sensors and try to monitor the damage done to the dummy. Now, you can do that in a far more sophisticated way virtually on computer. So and that saves a lot of time in bringing products to market because you do your prototyping on computers, not by physically building things. But there is a supply chain issue. Um, the SMEs in the supply chains behind the industries using these technologies don't necessarily understand high-performance computing. They have not individually necessarily invested in them. So what the kind of things we're looking at is if we can help provide, this is the kind of catapult center model, we can help provide some of the basic facilities that can then be rented out for a week by an SME that's been supplying Jaguar Land Rover for a decade but if it's to carry on working efficiently as part of the Jaguar Land Rover supply chain, it has to be able to use computers and do the modeling that they're doing in the Jaguar Land Rover central research facility. And they may not currently be able to do that. I mean, that's just one example, but there, it's things like that. And, you know, and it, that kind of answers the co-investment question as well. I mean, the trouble is there are so many different examples. I'm trying to think of one. But say in the speech, I talked about biologics, which is a, a particular, which are, um, large molecule pharmaceuticals. Now, again, I don't claim to be an expert in any of these areas. What I, what I am told is that this is where there's a large amount of research going on at the moment, and manufacturing those is particularly tricky, and conventional chemical manufacturing processes don't work so well. Now, I am not a pessimist and a defeatist <coughs> about manufacturing always heading east. I think it'd be great if some leading life sciences companies wanted to invest in the manufacture of this next generation of pharmaceuticals in the West, in Europe, and particularly in the UK. If we can build a kind of prototype facility, a demonstrator facility, where the manufacturing technologies can be refined, then they're more likely to do it. And again, in US, two weeks ago, in California, I visited the San Francisco-based fund for regenerative medicine, a state funding agency, and they're not just funding the upstream research into stem cells, they are funding the prototyping of the manufacturing techniques you need for stem cells before they go commercial. So funding the prototyping and the trialing of manufacturing techniques, if they do these things in the US, I don't see why we shouldn't do them here. Gentlemen in the second row. 
Uh, <coughs> Hi there, Jeff Brumfield with Nature Magazine. So in 2010, um, the government announced a 40% cut to capital, uh, which came out to about 870 million, I believe. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, I mean, you've alluded to this earlier, but more explicitly, how is this not just treading water, bringing us back to where we are? I mean, what's different about what you've announced today as opposed to what was cut back in 2010? Well, um, we have, uh, science capital has had a, uh, had, if, I, if I'm, I'm trying to sort of draw in my mind a graph for science capital spend, it had a, it had a rather um, bouncy ride under the previous government in concluding within the first year of the financial crisis, they're taking a deliberate decision to take la capital spending from the later years and bring it forward into 9-10. So 9-10, there was an artificial peak in capital spend. And we inherited plans for big falls in capital spending after that. We didn't make further cuts to capital other than the overall reductions to capital that we inherited in the previous government. And what I've been doing, working very closely with the Chancellor, who completely gets this, is we have been, as I said, most of that one half billion is extra capital. And it means that even when public expenditure is tight, we are able, and I can't say it's, it's not quite a stretch forward, it's saying broadly flat, but there is now a healthy capital expenditure program for science of something approaching, on average, a billion pounds a year. And I have to say, when I go around other advanced Western countries, thinking to find everything's completely different, and they're just, because uh, I read in the papers how our position is somehow tougher, almost everyone is talking about budget constraints. Almost every international science gathering I go to, the question is whether everybody's going to be able to pay their contributions this year. The, when I, as I said, when I observe in the US, increases followed by reductions. And I regard that, especially because it's being spent in a smart way, drawing on the best advice in the science community, as a very strong signal that we are absolutely committed to world-class science in Britain. Gentleman by the door, sat at the back. Thanks. Um, fascinating speech. Sorry, Chris Waterman from Education Journal. Um, and a grandfather, so I'm trying to give my grandchildren back <coughs> what I stole from their parents, according to your baby boots. <laughs> so two, two questions, really. Um, I appreciate that you're the minister for, what does it say? It says universities, universities and, science. and science. Fascinated to hear you change STEM into STEAM. Could you say a bit more about that? And also, for my six-year-old grandson... When we're back here in 10 years' time, what will you have done to his education so that he can become one of these researchers? Well, first of all, I, I, agree, with, I agree with you um, about the importance of uh, exchanges between the generations, an obligation between the generations. As you rightly say, I wrote a book on this, The Pinch, came out just over two years ago. Um, the uh, still available in all good books still <laughs> in paperback now uh, uh, and one of the best arguments that, the, that members of the science community put to me was they because of course uh, they're all very smart and they said to me okay um now mr Wooditz, this is the argument we are the beneficiaries of research and scientific discovery conducted by previous generations and we have a similar obligation to carry out scientific research to hand on advances to future generations we can't be the people who call as a whole call a halt and just enjoy what the benefits of what previous generations did, and I think that's a very powerful argument. Uh, for the education overall, I would say the, uh, that the Michael Gove's commitment to academic rigour in our schools is absolutely right, and that's the best single birthright a young person can have to enable them, if they wish to, to move into the sciences. And your final point on STEAM, yes, I think it's very important. Uh, the, the, the being multidisciplinary, um, because I focus today on physical sciences because they tend to be capital intensive. Um, but uh, being a historian, studying a foreign language, being an expert on a foreign culture, under, uh, studying literature are also inherently worthwhile activities. And we are supporting research in the Arts and Humanities Research Council, for example. It, with the, on exactly the same balance relative to physical sciences 
has for the last few years. They are all self-confident parts of a world-class research community. And we've got time for one final question. The gentleman back here. James Plunkett from Resolution Foundation. Um, I suppose one of the challenges with these kind of sectors and technologies is that they're, they're almost inevitably very capital intensive, highly productive, and so just don't employ that many people. Um, now of course, they might have supply chains that have knock on effects and employ uh, moderate numbers of people, but they're never going to be mass employment sectors in the way that retail, social care, and so on are, and are growing sectors. Um, so, how do you think about kind of the relationship between? industrial strategy and living standards and I guess the question is uh, is the criteria um, growth are you in pursuit of growth or are you, are you trying to create large numbers of good quality jobs because I think there's kind of quite different different criteria yeah I, I mean there's always been fears over the centuries haven't there that technological advance destroys jobs but the evidence is the contrary I mean that um, we're not in a world where people where people's needs are sated and we just all sit at home whilst everything is delivered in an automated way. There's an endless need, human need, to do new things. And uh, so we haven't run out of jobs to do. And I don't believe we will because of technological advance. This is, this, these kind of things I'm describing should certainly be good for living standards and should be good for exactly what the Resolution Foundation rightly cares about, uh, which is kind of average wages because the more the way to raise wages is for workers to work with more capital both intellectual capital and physical capital and the more capital that they have behind them the more productive they are and the more they can earn um, and so take say social care classic example I think it's Again, we may be proved completely wrong, but I personally think social care is likely to become a very important, a growing part of the economy. Um, I think some of these technologies could transform social care. I mean, certainly in Japan, they're very interested in it, and obviously in, the ro in robotics for delivering services to elderly people, for disabled people. Um, I don't think that will... Uh, and I think that that is not just good for the quality of life of the, of the consumer, if you like, it means there will still be people working in the social care industry, but their wages will be higher because they'll be doing much more high-tech jobs. They'll be ensuring that at homes with many more automated devices to enable frail or disabled people to live higher quality of lives, they'll be trying to maintain those so that they all function properly and they'll be monitoring them. So I, I personally think this absolutely helps with your, your admirable agenda. Very sorry to say that we're out of time. Um, just to let people know that Further information about future events in this industrial policy series should be on your chairs. We've got Lord Heseltine coming in on the 13th of February and Lord Adonis on the 17th of April. Um, thank you very much, Reverend, for coming, and particularly thanks to David for such a fascinating and important speech. Can we thank him in the usual way?